Good afternoon and welcome to this Euractive EA Debates and thank you so many of you for registering this afternoon. We hope to have an informative and interesting discussion. Now, we're discussing today the transformation of African economies and the case of Botswana as a gateway to doing business in Africa. We will hear from one of the ministers of Botswana as well as four expert speakers. Now, you're joining via Vimeo and YouTube, so please do use the Q&A button or the query button to ask ask questions of our speakers and I will do my best to put those to them during the conversation. With that, let me turn over first to the Honourable Peggy Onkutwile Serame, the Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry of Botswana. Thank you very much, Madam, for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me acknowledge the Managing Director for Africa at the European External Action Service the ambassador of Botswana to Belgium, as well as the member of European Parliament, and who is also the rapporteur of the new Africa EU strategy. Uh, let me also recognize our panelists and the distinguished guests who are joining us this afternoon. Very good afternoon to members of the private sector and the civil society who are also joining us today. Um, let me start by expressing my appreciation to all of you for joining this virtual conference. This conference bears testimony to the importance that we attach to the advancement of the relationship between Africa and Europe. I therefore wish to commend the European Union for initiating the draft strategy that will form the basis of consultation for a future partnership agenda based on a strong political relationship and close cooperation in key areas between the two regions. I am particularly pleased that the key areas of the proposal include peace and governance, green transition and energy access, sustainable growth and jobs, digital transformation, as well as migration and mobility, which have already been prioritized in the Africa Union Blueprint Agenda 2063, the Africa that we want. This is a strategic framework for inclusive growth and sustainable development to optimize the use of Africa's resources for the benefit of all Africans. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa is ready to work with the European Union to come up with a strategy that promotes common interests and aims to achieve shared strategic objectives with concrete targets, but most importantly, that strengthens and supports Africa's priorities. True partnership can only be realized by a renewed commitment from both sides to refocus this relationship by creating a mutually beneficial alliance based on respect, understanding, and the pursuit of a prosperous future for all. At this moment, allow me to reflect on the Africa-EU trade relations and to emphasize that EU will remain Africa's important trading partner. The Eurostat data shows that in 2019, over 65% of goods imported to the EU from Africa were primary goods, while almost 70% of goods exported from the EU to Africa were manufactured goods. It is our hope, therefore, that the European Partnership Agreement between EU and the African countries will create value in the global value chains, with majority of processing retained in Africa to create the much needed jobs and the technical know-how. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Africa presents better prospects when it comes to attracting foreign direct investment. The 2019 Ernst Young Africa Attractiveness Survey however, indicate that FDI into Africa remains small by global standards, but prominent in relation to GDP. It is apparent that Europe will remain an important source of FDI globally, and most importantly, into Africa. The 2020 FDI Greenfield Investment Report highlights that Western Europe region was the leading source for FDI in 2019, with 7,210 FDI projects recorded. This accounted for 46% of all FDI globally and $300.5 billion in capital investment. In light of this, Africa remains ripe with business opportunities in a number of sectors, including infrastructure development, energy, agriculture, natural resources, as well as ICT, amongst others. These sectors coincide with the priority areas for partnership identified by the European Commission in their March 2020 publication entitled Towards a Comprehensive Strategy with Africa. In this regard, we look forward to the adoption of a balanced strategy 
that incorporates the key priority areas of Africa strategy by the Africa EU summit. The strategy will, without any doubt, open up new opportunities for growth and development in Africa and in Europe, underpinned by trade and investment. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Botswana and member states of the EU stand to reap maximum benefits by creating strategic partnerships and can be used as a model for the transformation of other African economies. Botswana has a politically stable and mature democracy with an established rule of law, offering a secure and predictable business environment. Our impressive record in managing the economy judiciously and prudently during the last 54 years is evident in how we have transformed from one of the poorest economies in the world to an upper middle income country. Other factors that stand out include a stable multi-party democracy, a good legal system and independent judiciary, respect for and protection of private property, sound macroeconomic framework, fiscal discipline, sensible regulatory reforms, as well as a commitment to the respect for individual human rights and fundamental freedoms. Furthermore, we are committed to creating and further improving the doing business environment that will facilitate attraction for investment, a supportive infrastructure, and competitive and highly productive workforce. We will continue to open up our economy to the global world and to international expertise and know-how and to make foreign investors feel most welcome. I wish to share with you some of the ongoing policy reforms uh, that the country is undertaking to create a, an even more investor-friendly environment with a view to enhancing the country's competitiveness, leveraging on digital transformation. This include establishment of online business registration system, establishment of a customs management system, which forms the foundation for the development of a single window system and one-stop border posts with our neighboring countries. Negotiations are already ongoing with on these reform initiatives and already the latter will be, that is the one-stop border post, will be implemented between Botswana and Zambia at the new Kazungula Bridge. Other developments include development of electronic filing and payment of tax system, as well as enactment of a number of laws. These laws include Electronic Communications and Transactions Act, Electronic Records and Evidence Act, Cyber Crime and Computer Related Crimes Act, Trade Act, Industrial Development Act. There's also a strategy that was recently develop developed and approved by government, which is the Digital Transformation Strategy, which we believe is key to transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of Botswana has for many years extended incentives that have set it apart as a credible investment destination in Africa. These include financial incentives and transparent tax procedures, a fully liberalized economy with no restrictions on business ownership, allowing for full repatriation of profits, investments, and capital gains by investors. Uh, in also, duty-free importation of machinery and equipment for manufacturing purposes, a sound monetary policy with low inflation rate, and an educated workforce. Leveraging on our ideal location in the heart of Southern Africa makes Botswana an attractive base for private investment to supply an estimated market of 277 million people in the region. The much anticipated operationalization of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement further places Botswana at a vantage point for investors to set up and access a single continental market of 1.2 billion people for the supply of goods and services. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the government of Botswana recently adopted an economic recovery and transformation plan costed at about 1.5 billion pula, which has prioritized a number of sectors, and this include infrastructure, support for agriculture and manufacturing, the creative industry, as well as improving the doing business environment and accelerating regulatory reforms, while we also promote digital transformation as priorities for stimulating the economy. On digitization, we'll also learn from experience of other countries to ensure that we replicate what has been done in those countries with new investments in the digital space in Botswana, which also provides opportunities for some of, of our partners in the European countries. Further, Botswana has abundant renewable energy potential, particularly in solar and biomass, that remain largely untapped. We have been blessed with 3,200 hours of sunshine per year, 
endowing the country with one of the highest levels of solar irradiation in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I would like to reiterate that Botswana is ready to partner with the European Union on several key sectors of the economy, such as manufacturing, financial and business services, agro-processing, just to mention a few. We are convinced that harnessing the opportunities between Botswana and Europe will increase investment and trade. I believe that this virtual conference will assist us to cultivate long-term and sustainable business relationships. I also expect that the resulting networking opportunities will generate the desired investment leads for Botswana to diversify the country's economy and create sustainable jobs. The team will share more details regarding other opportunities of interest to you, and I look forward to constructive discussions and exchange of ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, with these few remarks, let me thank you for your attention. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, just a quick follow-up question. You mentioned the 6th African Union-European Union Summit that's due to be held or scheduled to be held later this year in Brussels. Now, we know it's a very difficult time with the pandemic for both blocs. Does that mean we should lower our expectations of the summit? Uh, what do you think will come out of it? Um, I certainly, straight away, would like to say I don't think we should lower our expectations. But whatever happens, because we're in the middle of the pandemic and really uh, whether we'll be meeting uh, and how we're meeting will be determined by that. But I still believe that we can achieve the desired results, even if we are to meet virtually. I think that we can still, today's conference is a testimony that we can still achieve the results, even if we have to meet virtually. But I believe those sectors are critical and we can still make progress and agree on how we move forward. Okay, I'm going to go to a question that we have come in from Anton Mifsud Bonici, and that is, is, the investment, is investment protection part of the inclusive growth strategy? It's a very specific question. I don't know if you want to take it now. Um, I don't know whether you want to take it now or later on after some of the presentations, because I think some of the aspects will be covered. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. As you mentioned, we have got a great panel and thank you again for your time today. I hope you'll be able to stay with us for some of the rest of the discussions. Let me now I mention that we... Thank you. Let me now mention we have got uh, representatives from the Botswana Investment and Trade Centre, from Business Botswana, from the European Centre for Development Policy Management and from the External Action Service. Let me start by introducing André Simek, Desk Officer for Botswana and South Africa at the EEAS. Uh, let me hand over to you, Mr. Simek, and give us your opening statement and your thoughts on the future of the links between the two blocks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, uh, and um, I, I don't want to take a lot of time, I think, in these introductory remarks, because the objective here is to have uh, somehow uh, a dynamic discussion. So let me just say from the very beginning that I'd like to thank uh, Euroactive for, uh, for hosting this, uh, this uh, seminar or this conference today, and also to the mission of Botswana for supporting it. Uh, and to all the speakers and especially to honor minister for giving us such a good uh, overview of the situation uh, uh, just just now we are of course now in this very odd situation with uh, covid 19 sort of dominating uh, everything uh, in international relations and uh, uh, i think our, our take on it is that you know we cannot really let that happen i think we have to kind of continue to move forward and uh, this question of sort of economic cooperation, investment, and uh, uh, sort of economic recovery from from uh, the, the the impact of of, of COVID nineteen uh, is is really is really crucial. And so that's where I think this discussion comes in very very timely. It also comes in very timely because we are, I think, as as both of you, as you and Honorable Minister already mentioned. We're now in the process of uh, uh, working towards the preparation of the EU-Africa Summit, uh, or I should say perhaps African Union-EU Summit, um, uh, that uh, will not be uh, taking uh, place, uh, unfortunately, 
because of the COVID situation uh, before the end of this year, but uh, will be will be postponed until next year. Uh, it's also, I think, the discussion is also quite timely because here in the in the European Union, we are now preparing the next uh, programming stage for our development assistance, which we use to um, support uh, countries around the world in their own efforts. So I think that whatever comes out from this discussion is also something that can feed into into that debate. Uh, now, let me just say on the EU Botswana relations that we have very stable and very, I think, friendly, friendly relations. We have uh, our political ties have really uh, uh, become more frequent uh, since autumn last year. We had our political consultations in Gaborone in uh, in February, and uh, we also had several other engagements. Uh, at different levels uh, uh, during the year. And um, I, the question of uh, sort of economic uh, transformation in Botswana has always come into these discussions. Um, uh, what we see is, of course, the, the, the interest on our side to uh, the, 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 the partnership has quite a lot of potential because we're quite like minded on a lot of things. And uh, so what we are interested in doing is to sort of widen the scope of our cooperation and also to deepen uh, the partnership. Uh, on the economic side, I think the minister has already raised this. Uh, Europe is really the main source of the foreign direct investment in Africa. And it's the same thing in Botswana. Um, I, of course, the numbers are always changing, but uh, more than I think one third of the FDI in Botswana comes from the EU with most of the investment going into the mining sector, but uh, also the investment in the, in the services has been growing. On the trade relations, it's pretty much the same. Um, although, of course, there we are a little bit overtaken by South Africa, which uh, has the advantage of the proximity to Botswana, but we are nevertheless the second biggest trading partner for Botswana. Uh, and uh, from Botswana to Europe, uh, we're primarily receiving uh, diamonds. Uh, that's really the main, uh, the, the main bulk of the trade. The volume has been declining, but we're also beginning to import uh, increasingly more of uh, Botswana's beef. Um, the, the Botswana economy, I think, uh, if you read the, the strategy 2036 and also the midterm review of the national development uh, plan, I think you see that the, the economy has not really changed significantly over the last 20 years. To, uh, primarily because the country has been blessed uh, by, by having natural resources uh, that are in high demand and that have really helped Botswana to make a astonishing progress from uh, one of the poorest countries to uh, upper middle income country within the period of 50 years. Um, we see, of course, now that the government uh, sees the need for diversification of the economy and uh, so given the political and the economic relationship that we have between you and Botswana, it is quite natural that uh, we should be uh, one of the main partners to accompany uh, the, the, the country on its way. Um, I think this is really also kind of fitting into the broader picture of the, of the relationship that we have between the two continents and uh, the honorable minister already mentioned that. Uh, we are uh, very much uh, supportive of developing the partnership between EU and Africa uh, on uh, five different areas. And, uh, and uh, so, I mean, it, there, is a, there is a real, a real convergence between the bilateral relations that we have with Botswana and the more continental approach. Um, thank you again for organizing this. I very much look forward to getting the views of the uh, speakers and also of the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Simak. We'll turn now to Business Botswana and the President Gobusaman Kebin. Can you hear me, sir? Give us your opening thoughts and your opening comments for today's debate. Thank you. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thanks. Um, Business is uh, in Botswana. It's, it's really small, but we've seen a lot of concerted effort from government to grow business. And uh, it's uh, it's uh, this, this is despite the pandemic that we are going through. Uh, we have seen focus 
and concentration on ensuring that Botswana business grows and is competitive to the world. Obviously, with the opening of the uh, continental free trade area, it is in our interest as business to ensure that uh, we are ready to participate, we are ready to export, and uh, hence we are, we've been undertaking quite a lot of uh, activities on ensuring that um, we get uh, private sector business ready to participate meaningfully in uh, what the government has set pace for, for us. We are focusing on areas of agriculture, areas of manufacturing, ICT, health, education, etc. And uh, uh, I'm quite excited to say uh, the collaboration, therefore, between the government and the private sector is, in my view, bearing fruits. Am I, am I talking to myself? No. Okay. <laughs> so it is, it is bearing fruits, and we're quite excited that um, uh, we believe uh, when this pandemic that has really crippled us uh, subsides, we should be able to lift our heads and be able to work uh, uh, harder to ensure that uh, Botswana, its location, its proximity to ports in uh, Namibia in South Africa, the infrastructure that is being planned, which could, which could be um, uh, connectivity, rail connectivity from Namibia, uh, infrastructure uh, connectivity, uh, to South Africa through new railway lines and connectivity up north, that, in our view, is going to ensure that the uh, private sector and business generally uh, should uh, increase and uh, grow as we wish it to. Thank you. Thank you. We uh, already have a question in on investment, and uh, we will come back to that after we have heard from Philomena Apico, the Policy Officer, African Institutions and Regional Dynamics Programme at the European Centre for Development Policy Management. Ms. Apico, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, Active and the mission of the panel for the opportunity to participate as a panellist. And uh, to Honourable Minister Serame, my fellow panelists and the audience, I greet you. So I, I had initially had my own uh, set up, but I think it's best for me to actually focus more on what has already been said to avoid repetition. And then, of course, I have some questions being in the, in the policy world. It's one thing to have um, laws and regulations set, but another thing to have them actually be implemented on the ground. So uh, thank you so much, um, Minister Serame, for providing some of the uh, key highlights for making Botswana you know, a favorable business um, uh, place and gateway to doing business in Africa, of course, compared to like the neighbors uh, and other African countries, there's been better governance and stability as also as well, better management of natural resources being the diamonds. And there's been also a lot of um, efforts made towards uh, promoting Botswana as a, as, a, as a destination. And I'm glad to see that Mr. Um, Olivile from the BITC is also here and you can add some more to that. Very good uh, skill workforce and political environment. But for me, there are also some issues uh, that I think Botswana could still address and also go a long way to make it more of an investment destination. The country is not without challenges. Firstly, I would like to, I mean, thank you so much for the, the point that was made on the private sector. But for me, I would like to go a little bit deeper and know how exactly is the private sector organized in Botswana? Is there opportunity for more support towards private sector development? Outside of Khaborone, how is the other private sector organized in the other, um, um, other towns of Botswana. Also, did they receive uh, development support from the EU towards some of their private sector development um, measures in place? And then I'd like to also uh, focus more on uh, the, I think the real key issue when it comes to uh, Botswana is that much as it has a skilled labor force, there is still a problem of, of, of unemployment. This is a growing problem, especially amongst the youth. And um, you, you see that there is a sort of mismatch between the graduates being turned out, out of University of Botswana and other institutes, whereas uh, the needs of the markets, for example, when investors are looking for people to hire, you find that they, they don't have enough skills locally and have to maybe rely on expatriates to fill up the gaps. 
So one of my first key messages is, is that without real transformation and uh, persistent unemployment uh, problems, there's a need to encourage not just an investment, but job creating investment to enable to, to enable Botswana to actually meaningfully uh, have its youth and, and other members of society participating in these investment opportunities. And then the second one is uh, Minister Sarah May spoke about the CFTA, and you know that is really something that Africa is, is doing to try and improve into African trade. And for me, the real um, issue is that when we look at the realities on the ground, especially post-COVID, and the need to look inward, you know, the the, the need to, to to have more domestic production, it shouldn't just about domestic production. I feel like Botswana has opportunities to be to be got from not the CFTA alone, but also SADC. Within SADC, they have the trade protocol, and this enables trade amongst the member states. So the real question will be how to leverage investment to, for example, uh, ensure that Botswana doesn't just remain small, but actually feeds into the, the overall um, African market. If you look at the latest vision, 2036, this is one of the key things that is highlighted, the need to actually expand markets. And this means connecting with other African countries and, and, and um, using the opportunity to actually join value chains. And I think this is something Botswana should be looking at really well. Uh, I mean, just to maybe give an example, I know there's a special economic zone in Lovate that was set up to, to deal with uh, leather. And I think I read um, one of the articles saying that they were still struggling with issues of supply. And this could, for me, be an opportunity to link with other uh, leather suppliers in the region, Namibia, who also has a really lucrative cutter, cutter sector and South Africa as well, to be able to actually make this a meaningful uh, investment to, to attract um, more employment opportunities. So um, and and then when we look at, at the at the EU um, support, as was mentioned uh, by by Mr. Simek, the EU and Botswana have a very good relation in terms of support. I did some 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 research last year looking at the the EPA process and how you know Botswana and the EU are working towards implementation of the Economic Partnership Agreement. And actually, it was quite good because the there was a symmetry between the priority goals of the of the ministry and also what the EU was willing to support. So I think there's a good working relationship. And going forward, when you speak about the comprehensive strategy with Africa and towards the summit next year, for me, I see three key areas of partnership with Botswana. The first being the partnership for digital economy. The country itself, as also um, shared by the minister, has really taken steps to a digital transformation. I know they have an innovation hub in, ex in existence in the country, which is used as a platform for technologically driven and knowledge intensive businesses to attract also much of the youth who have these skills. And I think you, we can see within Africa, the example of Rwanda, which is really good to see how this can be leveraged. Uh, another, another example, as was mentioned as well, is the partnership for green transition and energy. Of course, Botswana does have a really hot summer days and <laughs> it'd be good to be able to use some of the natural resources to actually fit into renewable energy. And the last, of course, being the partnership for sustainable growth and jobs, which I said links again to regional integration. It shouldn't just be looking inward, but rather making linkages, not just regionally, but continentally and also to global value chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've raised some interesting points there, and many of which we will come back to in our discussion. Uh, let us turn now to Botswana Investment and Trade Center and the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer, Kaletso Sise Olebile. Please, sir, your turn to give us your opening thoughts. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I think we need to mute. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes, uh, we represent Botswana Investment and Trade Center, an agency that uh, works under Minister Sarame, who has just uh, addressed the gathering. Um, we also uh, recognize the senior executives gathered in the room with us today. I think, yes, this discussion couldn't have come at a better time. Um, that indeed um, Africa and the EU needs to strengthen investment and trade ties. And in saying so, I think history is going to be the best teacher in terms of um, maybe the status quo up until now. We do note as the investment uh, facilitation arm that global investment inflows, uh, as reported uh, in the World Investment Report by UNCTAD, stand at around uh, 1.2 trillion uh, United States dollars. But why is it that, as we always say, Africa is the next frontier for investment? Africa is currently capturing only 3% of these massive global investment flows. I think there is something there that we need to discuss today uh, to see how we can unlock um, such flows into Africa. 
But within Africa, again, uh, there is a need to differentiate. While we can be Africa as a bloc, you'll find that we are at different stages of development and preparedness to receive investment uh, as countries. And Botswana has been such a jewel uh, within Africa with all the right attributes that you believe an investor uh, could be attracted by. But when you look at the numbers of all the FDI that is recorded in Africa, Botswana captures and, and uh, consistently over the years slightly uh, less than 1% of that. So it really says there must be something uh, that we need to unlock. And when we as assess as the investment promotion entity, particularly with the EU, we believe that there is a lot of awareness creation uh, that has to be put forward. For example, do all the investment, uh, the investors or potential investors in the EU know Africa for what it should be known for, and particularly Botswana, so that we differentiate and don't paint the whole of Africa uh, with one brush. So that is why we believe in this discussion, we can put forward what Botswana really has uh, uh, to offer. I like the theme uh, of this discussion this afternoon because it's saying, uh, the, it's putting forward the case of Botswana as a gateway uh, to business into Africa. If you look at the strategies pursued by this country uh, from as far back as 1999, it was exactly that, to position the country as a gateway for investment flows uh, into, into Africa. Uh, for example, uh, this country doesn't have any exchange controls in place. That was exactly for that reason that money has to seamlessly flow and deploy in business operations wherever they will be located. And that has been strengthened with creation of relevant frameworks like what we call the International Financial Services Center, which is fully compliant with the OECD International Tax Standard. Um, and there are a few companies that would have uh, domiciled under that. But again, it's, a, it's an issue of, of awareness to make sure that European businesses that want to launch into Africa should utilize the stability and long-standing attributes of Botswana to be able to seamlessly uh, penetrate into Africa. But again, to set the tone for the discussions, I think um, one of the key motivators for investors to select a certain country is usually market size. And Botswana is not well uh, uh, blessed in that regard. We're talking of a population of only 2 million people. And maybe that could be why people will neglect um, uh, investing in Botswana to choose other bigger markets, even if they, they, they possess, you know, maybe higher levels of risk in terms of the environment. So that is why the issue of uh, development of regional value chains uh, becomes very important. All our uh, policies, as I said, and strategies are aimed at not only looking at the small uh, population in Botswana, but how can we uh, effectively facilitate an investor into the rest of SADC, uh, the Southern African Development Community, as well as uh, the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. So those policies you find are already in place in Botswana, but I think what we need to create across the EU beyond just those policies is awareness, awareness, awareness. We currently have a, a set of double taxation avoidance agreements uh, with the EU. I think currently they stand at four uh, with Malta, France, Ireland, and Sweden. This, these are one some of the enablers that uh, really have to be in place in order for investors to channel their investments. Uh, we have six uh, such agreements, not yet in force, uh, but, but, but signed by the respective countries. Uh, that is between Botswana and Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg, Czech Republic, Estonia, and Portugal. So the other key enabler is how can we work as the two uh, blocks, as the country and the EU, to make sure that we entrench and multiply these double taxation avoidance agreements so that we lay the ground um, for, for investors to, to effectively uh, come in. So I think by way of opening remarks, uh, we, could, we could end it there. Um, the other issue maybe that we could um, you know, seek intervention on as we strengthen partnership is uh, the improvement of issue of green business in which our ministry has already done a lot but I think the issue of uh, particularly e-government um, and the utilization of e-commerce platforms is one key thing that can seamlessly connect us uh, with immediate. I think um, we will develop these points as we go in the discussion, but by way of opening, I can hand it back there. 
Thank you very much. I mean, you mentioned you the topic, much. of course, today is a gateway to doing business. And again, you mentioned perhaps market size is one of the barriers. We have a question coming in from one of our audience members, uh, also looking at the possibility of gateway and potential barriers. So it's Botswana can indeed be a safe gateway to Africa, but is the infrastructure within the country limiting sectors of investment? Um, is that a limiting factor? And maybe how could it be overcome? Perhaps, Mr. Kebin, you could could respond to that and, and then I will take some answers from the rest of the panel. Thank you. <clears throat> this, clearly there is a limitation uh, in infrastructure and as I said that limitation in my view is being addressed. Uh, currently there's work going on on the Kazungula Bridge uh, immediately and I think it's about to open if not open yet and then there's a railway connectivity on the same bridge into Zambia. There's also a railway connectivity that has been worked on, which will be focusing particularly on coal uh, exports from uh, Mamabulu into South Africa, eastern part of Botswana. Uh, there is a continuous discussion on uh, the Wolves Bay Namibia to Botswana rail line. So there is definitely at this point in time a, a, a concern as far as uh, uh, infrastructure is concerned, but I think it's something that recognizing uh, the, 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 the very critical position that we occupy geographically, it is important that these connecting uh, road, road networks and roads are of priority as far as the government of Botswana is concerned. Mm -hmm. So we're quite excited that we want to believe that in, in the foreseeable future, all this should be in place and therefore the infrastructure connectivity should be taken care of. We also have an infrastructure connectivity as far as air is concerned, but uh, I think it's something that we have seen in the past 10 years, the Botswana government ensuring that uh, they create four airports that are of international and uh, standard that mm -hmm. can take aeroplanes as big as 747s both cargo and, um, and, and, and and passenger. There's also work ongoing at this point in time to work on a logistic hub, logistics hub in the Francis Town area, which will be looking at all road transport from the north, from DRC, from Zambia, from Zimbabwe, etc., coming into Botswana and past transiting through Botswana to South Africa to ensure that that is also taken care of. So I think activities and plans that are at this point being worked on give one a full confidence that in the very near future, the issues of our connectivity uh, infrastructure will be, will, will be taken care of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Simek, the same uh, question to you. Can you reflect on whether there are infrastructural barriers to attracting investment in certain sectors? Uh, <clears throat> no, I cannot. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I mean, I'm not really an expert on infrastructure in, in uh, Botswana. I think it's, it's more for our colleagues from Botswana to sort of address this question than for myself. But I would like to maybe react to a couple of things that were raised by, by, by colleagues that, that spoke. So number one, um, I mean, on, the, uh, on, on, on investment, uh, sort of more generally, I think, on, on private investment, we, we sort of had that discussion there. Um, and I think one of the colleagues was talking about the, the investment climate in Botswana. Indeed, I think Botswana is a very attractive uh, destination because of its stability, because of the governance and, uh, and uh, several other issues. But there are also, I mean, one can always improve, I think. So uh, there are certain uh, sort of international, let's say, frameworks that are providing a bit of a snapshot of uh, where a particular country is in terms of uh, its, its investment climate. One of these things is this famous uh, doing business in uh, ranking, which is done by the World Bank, which uses a set of very simple indicators um, that uh, somehow create a little bit of a picture. It's not a full picture, but I think it is something that also says, um, you know, sends a certain me message to, to potential investors. What we see there is that Botswana, I think, is number 87 and is about six in, in, in Africa. So there is a possibility, there is a potential, I think, 
to perhaps look at some of these indicators and 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 see if if there are some things that could be done perhaps more uh, in in Botswana around those those issues. Um, I think the other one that was mentioned was the the sort of how how do we make Botswana more known to to the potential investors? Now, of course, this type of event is I think very useful if we do have any any investors, <laughs> potential investors participating in this. Uh, I know that there was a, originally a plan of doing uh, some kind of an investment conference, I think, in in, in Gaborone. And, uh, and certainly from the EU side, I think we would be interested to, to help uh, support that type of event. So, of course, engaging with our, with our uh, embassy there, I think, uh, you know, would, would go a long way. Um, it's also, I think, quite useful to find a way of engaging with the foreign investors and in this, in this particular context with the European investors that already exist in, in Botswana. I think we have these European business associations all around the world and I think we see uh, several examples of countries uh, that you know, move forward and are able to attract additional investment um on the grounds of having kind of an active dialogue with the investors that already exist in the country so i think that that's that's always quite useful i mean these investors talk to each other and they pass the positive uh lessons i think on and so that creates a certain um certain uh, action and perhaps attracts additional investment uh, i i very much agree with the with the point about the size of the market this is of course one of the issues that limit Botswana's um, uh, attractiveness, if you like. But uh, I mean, it is what, what it is, and one has to sort of live with that. This is not going to change very quickly. Uh, and, but I think that the advantage is that Botswana is right next to a very large economy and is also participating in that regional integration. And then we, of course, have the, the continental integration. Now, we from the EU uh, side uh, support these integration processes because it has worked very well for us in the EU and we believe this is a good model uh, to move forward. And that really brings me to uh, the uh, development assistance that we are using uh, or that uh, we are sort of allocating in Botswana. And indeed, it is very much linked to the vision of 2036. We are virtually focusing on development of uh, uh sort of technical and vocational skills so uh trying to uh, support botswana in in developing uh, sort of a manufacturing capacity if you like uh we also uh have a specific support for job creation and investment climate again which should be helping botswana to address uh sort of whatever is pending in terms of the uh, investment climate in the country and then we have another program which is around the implementation of the uh, economic uh, partnership agreement which is uh, the legal framework for the trade relations trade and investment relations i should say between eu and SADC countries so uh, and then there are so sort of small instruments around that so i think that there is a lot out there and uh, really what is key is to to take to take advantage of that thank you Thank you. Ms. Apico, I want to come back to you on a point you made also about skilled and whether there were enough skilled workers. We have um, a question that has come in from uh, one of our viewers that is, what is the request for training on agile project management and digital transformation? Now that's a, a very specific question, so perhaps you could reflect more broadly on where the areas are that you see a skills gap. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Um, I'm aware, like for, for Botswana, because I've, I've also done some research on on that around the technical and vocational training. And my um, analysis would be that there seems to be a lot of um, investment in education, which is a good thing, but they need to invest in the right skills. So it, it has to be our sort of working with industry. Government should then ask from industry what are the kind of jobs that you would would like to see you know more, more graduates coming out of and that way when they're giving for example scholarships or when they are uh, um, encouraging the youth you know in investment or sorry education opportunities they're geared already towards the industry for for Botswana I mean there has been some uh, I mean the, most of the skills would have to go around what the country itself is already doing. So I know with, for example, the diamond uh, cutting and polishing that was moved to Botswana, and there's a lot of investment that went to, to having the, the, the Botswana office in Botswana. 
And then also now with, for example, um, value chain addition with the leather pack, with the special economic zone in Lawasa, this is something that they could be encouraging more youth to go into. So I am, I am okay for supporting, you know, for example, education in an academic stream, but I think we should not forget the technical and vocational skills necessary for industry to thrive. Uh, maybe my um, panelists from Botswana can also add to this, but that was my impression from, from, from what I read about the, the situation. Thank you. I think we will uh, we'll hear now, Mr. Again from Mr. Olebile. You've heard uh, your colleagues there speaking at length. Um, what's your perspective on this question of skills? Uh, thank you very much. I think um, you know the issue of skills shouldn't be much of a challenge. You can address it just generally from the literacy rate of Botswana, uh, which is way above your eighty-five percent. So that already says you have a generally highly educated workforce. Uh, within Botswana. I always argue that uh, workers will not usually be plug and play. You always have to customize them to your specific processes and work streams as a company. But um, if you look at the current reality that we host a whole lot of sophisticated uh, investments, number one, uh, that we can cite and also speak into regional value chains, being the or motor vehicle harnesses, uh, the wiring harnesses that are used predominantly by the original equipment manufacturers in South Africa. More than 50% of those are coming from Botswana. And in the majority, these companies will be employing Botswana. So the level of technical know-how that is required and the level of delivery by this workforce is quite encouraging um, that uh, we wouldn't be short of skills. But the other side of it is that we are quite liberal in terms of permitting importation of skills. The institution that I lead hosts um, the national one-stop shop which is where if as an investor you believe that uh, there is a certain skill that you can't secure in Botswana, we make it very easy and seamless for you to be able to import. So yes, um, there is need obviously, uh, particularly through our cluster development initiatives to keep on customizing skills development to the requirements of industry. But what I'm trying to say is that even if you come now, there won't be much of a challenge of skills because already very sophisticated businesses are thriving uh, with the skills that we already have. Very much. Um, I think now what we'll do is we'll take another question from our audience and I believe we may have the minister back. She is listening uh, to comment on some of the remarks you've made so far. But first of all, we'll go to another question here from Anton Mifsud Bonici. And the question here is, is Botswana ready to export its rule of law and good governance experience across the continent? Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll go to Mr. Kevin for that, please. Uh, I mean, this, this is a fairly, a fairly straightforward question. I'm sure the answer is yes, but give me a, a perspective on how that might happen. Sporting rule of law. Exporting rule of law. Exporting rule of law across the continent, being a leader. Is that my question? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a given that uh, Botswana, 54 years later, it's seen is still practicing the best rule of law in the continent. I, I personally, at Business Botswana, what we see is we, we, we work with uh, chambers in the region, uh, in Africa as a totality. We work with them through a process that we call conversations with Africa. And one of the big things that we ensure goes through is how business is to be conducted in Botswana. Uh, because we, one, we, we fear anything that is criminality. And with that fear of criminality, therefore, we tend to ensure that the partnerships that we form in, in, in the world particularly in Africa, are very clear and are very understanding of the need to ensure that the rule of law is foremost in their governance structures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we have again with us uh, the Minister Serame. Uh, Minister, I know you've been listening intently to what uh, our other speakers have been saying. Perhaps you'd like to comment and give us some of your reflections. 
Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to all the speakers and for, for the questions. I, I wish we had more time, but I do hope that we'll have uh, another opportunity to engage further on some of the issues. Uh, let me start, uh, I'll try to be very brief on some of the issues. Let me start with the one on, are we ready to export uh, the rule of law? Yes, we are. I think that one is obvious. And also just to say that we are already working with a number of countries who have come to us to say they want to partner with us, they want to learn from us, and we've provided uh, our expertise and uh, traded in, in, in the skills that we have in, in some of the competencies. So I also believe that is an area that we really have a lot of uh, opportunities. We can scale up and export a, let, a lot more of what we've already done in Botswana and how we've learned over time. But that is not to say that we are not perfect. We also will continue to improve on a number of the areas. The other issue that you raised earlier on related to um, protection of investment, in the keynote address, I also indicated that um, our judiciary is, is very independent. We've put in place a number of laws. Uh, investors are protected, and the, the as well as some of the double taxation agreements and, and related laws and initiatives and strategies that were highlighted by some of my colleagues. So really, uh, I believe that uh, your investment is safe. You want to come to Botswana, but those are some of the topics that we can engage further on to give the specific details and the laws and how our courts are functioning. And we're also in the process of setting up commercial courts to ensure that if there are, there are disputes relating to investment, they can be dealt with speedily. The other issue related to skills development, uh, to say that there's a, a human resource development plan that is being finalized to address some of the challenges that were already highlighted. And of course, the unemployment is also, we can also look at it from another point of view to say we have excess skills in certain areas and certainly that is another area that we can probably uh, uh, export those skills. And the regional value chains, is another area that we are working on as, as Botswana and, and other members of SAPU. Uh, I think is areas that we can continue to improve on. The doing business is another area that really would require us to have an hour to take you through specific initiatives of what we are doing to address some of the challenges in the doing business. Uh, and, and some of them are addressing the ranking as was indicated. And I have to say that some of the laws that are indicated that were enacted and implementation of such started this year. We believe that the next doing business report that will come, there will be a significant improvement in the ranking. I thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Simak, I also want to ask you to uh, give me your thoughts. I mean, on the rule of law, exporting it across the block, as it were, so that Botswana is not merely a gateway, but also a leader. Is that something that you see happening? Well, I think that this depends entirely uh, on Botswana. Uh, so <laughs> it's not really up to the EU in a way to, uh, to, to pass a judgment on that. But I can say, uh, I think uh, I can just repeat what I said at the beginning. Uh, we, we already have very good, I think, uh, partnership between EU and Botswana. And uh, I have seen certainly that our political dialogue has uh, gained uh, more traction or perhaps a momentum uh, since uh, autumn last year. And, uh, but we also see that, of course, there is a bit of a limit in terms of the scope. And, uh, so I, I think it, it, it's certainly an interest on our side to, to, to broaden that. And, uh, and, you know, the issues around governance and uh, rule of law and, and so on and so forth, they are very much at the heart of the European integration process. And so that is, is also something that we are trying to address uh, through our external action and through the partnership with third countries. And so Botswana, of course, uh, is a very, very good partner with a lot of potential in this in this respect. Thank you. Now, I want to turn to Ms. Apiko. I know you had a, a comment or a question you wanted to drop in. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Minister Honorable Sterhame, and also Mr. Simic and the rest of the panelists for sharing your thoughts. I just had a question now that we're speaking about uh, the rule of law and exporting it to the Af other African countries. As Botswana, do you find that it, it does matter, for example, that you have not ratified some of the African Union's conventions, for example, the one in uh, the Charter on Elections, 
governance and democracy and also the Maputo Protocol on Women. So when we're looking at realistic investments for sustainable development and going forward, do you find that this might be a hindrance for you? And as we speak about regional developments, when you look at the other circle members, Namibia, South Africa and Eswatini have ratified the African uh, uh, continent of future area and Botswana hasn't. So when you're making plans, you know, towards attracting more investments, don't these continental uh, conventions also matter? Thank you. Uh, is that for the minister? I guess it is. It's for the minister, yes. Yes, please. Yeah, um, please. Honourable minister. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I think I missed the, the first bit. Uh, but the second uh, aspect of the question relating to the African continental free trade. Yeah. Yes, we haven't ratified. But uh, for, for us, the process of ratification is something that we can even do in a week. But for us to be able to uh, ratify any agreement, there are certain requirements and prerequisites that must be met, including that there has to be some value in this instance, because it's a trade agreement, there has to be commercial value that we can bring to the table. And once we can demonstrate that, then we will be able to ratify the agreement. It is something that we believe we are very close to ratifying because the, the, the negotiations are coming to us conclusion. I think the first aspect was speaking to some other conventions. I didn't quite get that. But just to say that, yes, all the 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 protocols that are in place are important for, for, for Botswana. And we, we, we do ratify and sign on to all the agreements and the protocols and the conventions that are in place. But it is also important for us to ensure that whatever we sign on to and whatever we ratify makes sense for us. And it is something that is actually implementable. That is why sometimes we take a bit of time to be able to sign on to certain agreements or even to, to ratify. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we're approaching the end of our time, but I'm going to ask a couple of more questions just as relates to the post-COVID world. Um, I think it was Ms. Apico who mentioned that perhaps there needs to be a little bit of a focus on self-sufficiently. So I would ask uh, both the gentlemen from Business Botswana and Botswana Investment and Trade Centre, how you react to calls that say Botswana needs to be self-sufficient in a post-COVID world. Uh, Mr. Olevile, let me come to you first. Yes, I think uh, we've learned our lessons um, during the COVID era, um, particularly in the space of uh, food production. I think, as you know, Botswana is a net food importer. And therefore, um, out of these lessons, we see the need for self-sustenance in most of the sectors that we promote. Therefore, if you look at our focus now, it's exactly that, to make sure that out of the lessons, um, we can direct investments to make sure that for all the lowest hanging fruits, at least uh, we can reach uh, you know, self-sustenance. So uh, you would see, I think, a policy shift uh, to make sure that at the end of the day, um, all the deficits can be, can be addressed. We continuously assess, for example, our import bill to say, what are we consuming in large numbers within the country uh, that is being imported, which we can maybe uh, direct our efforts to substitute and make sure that it can be done near shore. So to answer your question, it's, it's a very, very important intervention uh, in self-sustenance, and that's exactly what we are driving. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn to Mr. Kirbine. Uh What is your perspective on how business in Botswana has to change or has changed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? I think critically for us, as, uh, as uh, my colleague Reo Livile was saying, is to ensure that um, our businesses are in a position to export. And when I'm talking export here, obviously the say charity start is home. Uh, if, if you walk around some of uh, the big retailers in Botswana, they don't take uh, goods that are produced by our producers in Botswana, in some instances. And uh, when we try to find out why, it goes back to issues of standards, it goes back to issues of traceability. Uh, so what we have decided to do at Business Botswana is to ensure that we ensure that the standards are of internationally recognized standards, traceability is there, etc. We have also, through uh, our code of conduct, uh, are in the process of 
ensuring that um, EDD is uh, a part of business Botswana code of conduct. In other words, the big guys should be uh, obtaining from the small guys, whether it is vegetables, whether it is cereal, whether it is meat of any kind, uh, we should lessen the importation of sheep, goat meat, uh, uh, pig meat, all those kind of things to say, we can encourage Botswana to produce in numbers and in quality that ensures that at least let's make sure that we feed the nation. And when we do that, the standards are such that we can in the foreseeable future also be in a position to export because exporting to uh, Europe or wherever we export beef to Europe and we know the required processes of EU on what on how beef should be or cattle should be kept for them to be able to be exported. So we are taking that lesson and trying to spread it across all type of agricultural produce, whether, as I said, whether it is horticulture, small stock, uh, chicken or whatever to say, can we have minimum standards? Can we ensure that these standards are acceptable for European export? Uh, etc. for Agoa export etc. So it's important therefore that we start at home, ensure that our retailers buy from our producers and then we know that we can with time then, then be able to uh, start looking at beyond our borders. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Simak, a wrap-up question for you, which is very broad. It's simply, what would you like to see coming out of the 6th Africa-EU summit uh, that's, as I say, scheduled to happen later this year? We'll see how things go. Yes, that is a broad question. It's not an easy question. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, just from my personal perspective, rather than from the perspective of my institution, of course, I would like to see, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of a very ambitious uh, set of outcomes. Uh, I think we have sort of put forward the thinking that we have on our side. We had a sort of a policy paper that has outlined uh, the, the priorities that matter to the EU and certain proposals for partnerships uh, and I think Honorable Minister already mentioned those. This is very much around green transition and energy access, around digital transformation, around sustainable jobs and growth, peace and governance and migration and mobility. Those are the five main partnerships that we have there and uh, of course uh, what one would like to see uh, is to have some deliverables in these areas. Uh, and uh, so those may be at the level of bilateral uh, contacts, I, meaning between, between uh, EU and African countries, individual African countries or the continent as such. But uh, some of them also have a uh, global uh, dimension. I mean, especially the issue of climate change, and that's where the green transition sort of comes in. I think it's important that uh, the two continents really come together on that issue and I think push in the same direction because we are all being affected and our people, uh, our citizens are being affected. And of course, this agenda is becoming more and more political. And so it's uh, the political leaders in our countries, but also in the African countries that will be increasingly facing uh, questions from the citizens around that. So I'd like to see some kind of very ambitious, uh, you know, practical, uh, initiatives, agreements that we are then able to implement uh, over the period that will follow after the summit. Thank you. And Ms. Apiko, the same question to you. It's a broad one, but just to get your point across of what you would like to see coming out of the summit in an ideal world. <laughs> I like that ideal world. Question for me as a young African, it's a very good question to ask. I think I will echo the, the, the thoughts shared already by Honorable Minister Terame and also by Mr. Simek. For me, I would like to see you know, a, strength, a strengthened partnership that has a renewed commitment towards what works for both continents. It should be met a mutually beneficial alliance that is based on shared concerns and also shared uh, opportunities to learn from each other. It shouldn't be just one telling the other. 
it should be that, they, that we come together and, and have joint solutions to address some of the global problems, especially as mentioned, climate change, but also migration, uh, which is something that both continents should look at um, holistically. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you, because I see we are a little bit over time, although we started a little bit late. There are lots of questions coming in on technical issues, including on anti-money laundering. Very specific technical things are a bit beyond the scope of today's debate. So I'm sorry we didn't get to all of those. I'm going to ask the Honourable Minister if she would like to give some closing thoughts uh, before I say goodbye. Thank you very much. And uh, just let me start by thank you very much to, to everybody. This has been quite interesting. I do hope that we'll do this soon. Um, on the EU Africa Summit, just to reiterate what you've already said, that really it is quite clear that we are agreed on the priorities. For the next stages, it is important that we come up with very practical uh, initiatives that are time-bound, that can be implemented, where both parties can see how they are going to benefit. I think that is that is important like you are saying, the ideal world. So if you can come up with just a few specific, practical, implementable initiatives, I think that would be a, a successful summit. Now, coming to the issue of the, the production and the, the post-COVID world, the economic recovery and transformation plan that I spoke to earlier uh, uh, prioritizes agriculture and manufacturing. And that also speaks to the issue of productive capacity. So that will be one of the issues that we'll be looking at as Botswana to ensure that we build the productive capacity. And that includes ensuring that our goods as well are competitive such that they can enter the regional and even international market. So that is the other area. And, and lastly, uh, the issue on anti-money laundering. I think it's important that we speak about that as Botswana. It's an area that I believe also going forward we will continue to engage on as Botswana and the EU because it is an area that we are working very hard. We've put in place a number of laws, the initiatives that are ongoing. We believe that we are doing all we can to ensure that we improve our transparency. We are able to meet all the requirements uh, that are out there by the international community. So it is an area that we are working uh, hard on to ensure that we continue to improve. And I do believe that we should continue to engage so that also the EU side can appreciate what we are doing and we can understand uh, each other's point of view and where there are issues we can work together towards improving such. But otherwise, I think this has been quite interesting, quite useful. I believe that this is a start of, of more engagements and further engagements and we need to see concrete projects coming out of this. And just to say that in future, I also hope that we'll be able to share some of the specific projects that uh, one can invest in, in Botswana and even in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope so as well. I hope to hear more about it in the future. Uh, thank you very much to all our speakers joining us from, uh, from Botswana and from here in Europe. And also to our audience, around 100 people on there with all their questions and their great engagement. So thank you again for that. Do keep an eye out following the hashtag EA Debates for more Euroactive events in the future. And with that, I wish everyone a very good afternoon.